All right, let's go ahead and talk about the basic areas of finance, because before we can actually talk about what fintech is and how it affects the areas of finance, we need to understand what areas exist in finance. So this is just a very quick summary of the financial industry. If you're familiar with this, feel free to skip on to the next video. All right, so let's talk about the basic areas of the financial sector. So everything you see here is a, a role or a, an industry that a financial professional can work in. So we have corporate finance, which is the area dealing with the financial decisions of the firm. So does it issue dividends? Does it make a certain capital budgeting expenditure, et cetera, et cetera? Broker dealers are the firms that buy and sell assets on their own behalf and on behalf of their clients. The banking industry incorporates a huge number of banks. The insurance industry focuses on providing risk management solutions for individuals and firms. International finance focuses on money management across borders. Uh, it also deals a lot with political risk. And then we also have personal finance. So personal finance is obviously the financial decision-making area of individuals and families. So we have all kinds of certified financial planners and wealth managers out there that help individuals and families make decisions that would help them build a nest egg or save for, oh, let's say a college education, etc. And then lastly, we have investments. And investments incorporates a couple of different areas. We have security analysis, we have fundamental analysis, technical analysis, which are techniques. Uh, we have portfolio management, so the, the management of a portfolio of different securities. So hopefully you can get a sense here that there's a lot of different areas of the financial industry, and they are very, very different from one another. All right, so let's talk about corporate finance first. So like I said, it's the area of finance that deals with the day-to-day -day financial decisions of firms. And sometimes corporate finance is known as business finance. The top role of any corporate finance officer is usually the CFO of the firm, the chief financial officer. And they are obviously going to make a lot of decisions that impact the firm, but there's all kinds of other individuals who work under them, and those individuals will make a variety of decisions. And those decisions can encompass things like capital budgeting. So what does the firm invest in that adds value to that firm? So does this project have a positive NPV or IRR? Well, if so, we might consider investing in it. Financial managers might also make decisions with respect to the firm's financial policy. So how much of debt and equity and preferred stock do you use to fund your operations? So a firm needs to raise capital. It can raise it in a couple of different ways. It can borrow money, it can issue new shares of stock, and that money that's raised usually there's going to be a cost to that. You know, in the case of equity, equity investors expect some kind of return on their investment. In the case of debt, bondholders will expect something like a coupon payment, and you'll eventually have to pay the principal. Next, you're going to have to consider cash distribution. So corporate financial officers have to make the decision of how to distribute cash back to, well, the, the stakeholders in the firm. Usually we think of this in terms of the shareholders. So do you pay a dividend or do you buy back the firm's shares? And then finally, we tend to focus on liquidity management. So this is actually arguably the, the most common decision that corporate financial officers make day to day. I mean, you have to make sure that the firm has enough cash on hand for their operations every single day. You need to be somewhat liquid. So you need to make sure that the firm has a line of credit at a bank or you know, you make sure that it, it does have cash in its account. All right, next, we have broker-dealers. And broker-dealers are just firms that buy and sell assets for either themselves, in which case they're called dealers, or on behalf of their clients, in which case they're called brokers. Now, the reason we call them broker-dealers most of the time is because, well, a lot of dealers are also brokers, and a lot of brokers are also dealers. Uh, in the industry, we often... We'll just call them brokers for short, and everyone just kind of understands that they're they're buying and selling assets on their own behalf as well as their client's behalf. So if you ever hear the term broker, just assume that they're they're trading on their own behalf as well. Now you're probably familiar with a lot of different brokers out there, like Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, Robinhood. They all kind of have the same operations. Now, historically, 
a lot of these brokers, they made money on commissions. So let's say you had a TD Ameritrade account. Really before about 2018, if you made a trade, let's say you bought 100 shares of Apple stock, in addition to paying for the stock itself, you would very likely have to pay a commission to TD Ameritrade for them to make that trade happen. Although in the last couple of years, as you'll see throughout this, this playlist, this series of videos, those fees, those explicit fees actually went to zero. Nowadays, a lot of brokers, particularly the ones that you see here, they make money on uh, primarily payment for order flow. And payment for order flow is something that's relatively new. Basically, it's, it's this idea that the broker will receive compensation from a market maker by routing the broker's trades to that market maker. So we'll talk about market makers later in this class, but basically they're just companies that uh, will buy and sell shares, and the broker will actually send any trades that it can't fill on its client's behalf to those market makers, and the market maker will take the other side of the trade. Now the problem is market makers will very often not offer the best rate or the best price to the broker's clients. But hey, the broker gets uh, some compensation for sending those trades or those, those orders to the market maker. So that's, that's nowadays how they, they get compensation. And then finally, you know, in addition to payment for order flow, we also have commissions. So commissions are just fees on any trades. Uh, nowadays, commissions on equity trades are basically zero. Uh, last couple of years, that's diminished. I'll, I'll show you that uh, directly in a later video, just how quickly that diminished and how it affected the industry. But essentially, commissions, certainly on equity trades, and then also on a variety of other asset trades like derivatives, have diminished pretty rapidly in the last couple of years. All right, next let's talk about the banking industry. Now, the banking industry is broken down into various types of banks. So we have commercial banks, savings banks, investment banks, and credit unions. Uh, so the first three, you can kind of group them together. Uh, so commercial banks and savings banks and credit unions, basically these are financial institutions that accept deposits. So they will open a checking or a savings account for you and allow you to deposit money and earn some small amount of interest. And then they'll also make loans. So your deposits that you have a bro uh, an account with a bank uh, for, those deposits, they're not just sitting in an account somewhere. That bank is going to lend that money out. It could lend that money out to, oh, let's say someone who needs a mortgage or an auto loan, or maybe, a, say, a, a business loan. So historically, commercial banks will primarily issue loans to firms. Savings banks will primarily issue loans to families or households. And then credit unions, typically, they, they'll make loans to individuals or families, but the key characteristic with credit unions, the one that sets them apart from savings banks and commercial banks, is that not everyone can join a credit union. Typically, you have to be part of a group. So there's Ball State Credit Union. There's Teachers Credit Union. Basically, if, you're, if you want to join Ball State Credit Union, you have to be in some way connected to Ball State, a student, an employee, uh, somehow connected to them. Uh, same thing with Teachers Credit Union. You have to be a, a teacher or maybe the, the child of a teacher or something like that. All right, now we also have investment banks. And investment banks are a little different than the other three types of banks. Basically, investment banks, these are firms that help other firms and governments raise funds by creating new securities, new bonds, new shares of stock, new preferred equity, basically securities that you know we talk about in our basic investments class. Uh, so there's all kinds of examples of investment banks out there. Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase are two big, very prominent investment banks. So if, let's say, a company like Facebook wants to sell its shares to the public for the first time, what it'll do is it'll reach out to Goldman or JP Morgan or another investment bank, and that investment bank, and probably others, will sell those new shares of stock to the bank's clients. So the bank helps sell those shares to people who want to buy them, and it also helps the firm determine exactly what price they should be selling those shares. Now there is one thing I should mention. There's been a lot of changes in the banking sector in the last 20 years, and 
unfortunately, it, a lot of these lines between investment banks and commercial banks and brokerages have kind of been blurred. Nowadays, a lot of U.S. banks will offer some kind of brokerage arm or insurance services. Investment banks can also operate as commercial banks. A good example of this would be Goldman Sachs. Uh, so after the passage of one of the most important pieces of legislation, the Financial Services Modernization Act, Goldman, which had been an investment bank, registered as a commercial bank, I believe in 1999. So technically, Goldman is actually a commercial bank, even though we still think of it as an investment bank. So a lot of the operations of these distinct banks or brokerage firms are, are very much blurred. All right, now let's talk about the insurance industry. So insurance is just a form of risk management. So typically, the insured, anyone who wants an insurance contract, will pay a regular premium. It might be monthly or semi-annually or you know, maybe some different frequency. And the insurance company that gives them or takes the other side of that contract will indemnify the insured up to a certain amount. So for example, if you have a car and you want to make sure that you are covered up to, let's say, $10,000 uh, in case of an accident that you caused, you'd go out and get property and casualty insurance or auto insurance. Uh, there's all kinds of forms of insurance out there. Uh, we typically break them down into some very broad categories. So P and C or property and casualty. In there, we have homeowners, renters, auto owners, boat, flood, uh, basically anything that would cause damage to a piece of property or uh, you know something like that. Uh, we also have life insurance. And life insurance... There's a couple of different primary products there. Term life, uh, which is, you know, you get a million dollar contract for, you know, a few bucks when you're in your 20s. Uh, whole life, universal life, these are products that you pay into and you can actually uh, cash them in at a, at a later date. We won't really get into that because, you know, this is obviously not an insurance course. Now, there have been big movements in the insurance industry, and you're going to see this near the end of this this playlist of videos. Uh, the big takeaway I want to leave you with early on is that there are some rapidly growing new areas of insurance. Uh, cyber insurance and reputation insurance are two of the hottest areas of insurance. So cyber is insurance that covers your business liabilities in the case of a data breach. So let's say you got hacked or there was a terrorist event and you lost data. That data that was breached, uh, some someone took that data and ran up a bunch of credit card debt on your clients' uh, credit cards. So now there's, your clients are suing you. Cyber insurance should hopefully cover that. We also have something called reputation insurance. And reputation insurance is insurance that should, if you enter into it, help you repair a brand or your, your own reputation or your firm's reputation in the case of negative press or some public image damage. And the triggers for payout of reputation insurance, these are going to differ based on the actual contract, but usually with reputation insurance, there's some pre-event behaviors you have to take on or activities you have to undergo, like, uh, oh, let's say having a backup plan in the case of a, a PR nightmare. And then afterward, let's say you suffer a PR nightmare and it leads to a loss of revenue. As long as you've met every item in the insurance contract, that's when you get the payout. All right, next we have international finance. And international finance deals with essentially monetary interactions that occur uh, across national borders. And we have a couple of areas under this, this topic. Uh, the big one's going to be exchange rates. So how do we predict exchange rates? What factors impact exchange rates? And how does that affect, oh, let's say, uh, firms' fiscal or monetary policy? Uh, exchange rate risk is the risk of a change in those exchange rates, and typically we think of this as a change that negatively impacts someone. Also involved in international finance are two other issues. First is political risk, and the issue here is that different countries are going to have different political regimes. And the problem with this is that we could see changes in those regimes. For example, let's say tomorrow a country in Africa experiences a coup d'etat. So the government that existed was overthrown. We now have a new political regime, and now they're starting to impose a lot of new pressures or laws on businesses. Well, the risk of that coup d'etat happening 
is what we typically dub a political risk event. And when we talk about international finance, political risk is one of the biggest risks that we have to manage. So we will talk about this later in, in the series of videos. And then lastly, we have liquidity management. And, you know, not much to say here, but it, you need to make sure that your firm has enough cash on hand to meet all obligations. And the difficulty with this internationally is that, you know, there's different exchange rates and, you know, maybe you, you need to get some cash into a country in the local currency to be able to pay workers or build a new factory. And uh, that exchange rate, as it adjusts, could impact your ability to do so. There might also be capital controls that prevent movement of currency into the country. All right, next we have personal finance. And personal finance, we'll spend uh, several videos on this, but uh, this industry provides products and services to help clients manage money, save, invest, and also identify good insurance products. Now, I'll talk about the CFP track or Certified Financial Planners for the most part in this series of videos, mostly because that's what I have experience with. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it in the class itself, but prior to being at Ball State, I, I actually was the person heading up my prior employer, Indiana State's financial planning program. And so basically had to make sure that it was, it was in line with CFP standards. Uh, so I know a lot more about the CFP than a lot of other certification uh, tracks. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. But a CFP is a certified financial planner and they can work for either a larger firm or open their own shop. And their job is to essentially be a fiduciary for an individual or a household. And uh, you, there's all kinds of these CFP shops out there. So in the Indy area, we have Beetle, Edelman Financial Engines, which I guess is everywhere, Vallejo, uh, Market Street Wealth Management. Uh, so there's all kinds of shops. We also have companies like Northwestern Mutual that provide CFPs for individuals. Now, if you're interested in the CFP track and actually becoming a CFP, I'd encourage you to reach out because Ball State does have a minor in financial planning. So if you do have any questions about becoming a CFP, just go ahead and reach out to me because you know I, I can guide you in the right direction there. And then lastly, investments. And just like financial planning or wealth management, we're going to talk about investments a lot in this series of videos. But suffice it to say, when we talk about investments, there's a variety of asset classes out there. So stocks or equities, bonds, real estate, derivatives, real assets, currency, commodities, all of these asset classes can be invested in. And there's a variety of techniques that we use to determine whether we want to invest in some of these asset classes. Now, there are two terms that I do want you to remember before we actually get into the investment material, and those are buy side and sell side. And when I say buy side, what I mean is there are some investors that focus on buying securities for money management or investment purposes. So if I'm managing a portfolio and I'm determining what stocks do I add to the portfolio, I would be a buy side investor. I'm picking assets to either buy or short, and you know that, that's how I make my money. On the other hand, we have sell side individuals. And sell side individuals or institutions, these are the institutions that are involved with the creation and the sale of assets. So organizations like investment banks or brokers, these are organizations that were typically be dubbed sell side institutions. Their job is to essentially sell securities and other real assets. And so with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, so like I said, this is just a very brief overview before we actually get into fintech and the drivers of fintech. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I will see you on the next video.